Hello, and welcome to the Cardiometabolic Echo for the University of Washington Session 16. I'm Nicole Earhart, one of the adult endocrinologists at the Diabetes Institute at the University of Washington. And today we're excited to have Sandra Christensen, who's an obesity expert and is going to be talking to us today about core nutrition and lifestyle changes for weight management. Additionally, we have some great panelists today, including Lorena Wright, an adult endocrinologist at the University of Washington and the director of our Diabetes Latinx Clinic. We have Laura Montour, our family medicine doctor and also an obesity board certified doctor. We also have Allison Everett, who is our certified diabetes educator and also our nutritionist. And finally, we have Allison Ward, who is our psychologist with a specialty in diabetes and diabetes distress. So without further ado, Sandra, take it away. So today's topic is core nutrition and exercise changes for weight loss. These are my disclosures. And our objectives today are that we want to translate and incorporate core nutritional and exercise ideas from the diabetes prevention program into daily patient engagement to teach lifestyle changes. So we wanna take that information and learn how to use it with our patients. And then we will also talk about label reading and My Healthy Plate. And then we're going to apply our knowledge and partner with our patients to make small changes in our health settings. So obesity is the most common chronic disease in the United States. Almost 43% of adults have obesity and another 33% have pre-obesity or overweight. And lately, I've been thinking that we should rename that to early obesity, just like prediabetes is kind of early diabetes, like the disease process is already happening. And so when we put those numbers together, we've got over 75% of adults in our country are in unhealthy weight and nearly 20% of our children. And for both adults and children, non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics are more, more affected and we see higher rates for them. And obesity is at the root of many of the conditions that you're treating every day. And so often we chase after those and don't get to the root problem. And so that's what we're going to focus on today is the importance of doing that and why we want to incorporate lifestyle changes for our patients. So the goals of obesity treatment are just like any other chronic disease, not trying to cure it, right? We're trying to manage it and improve health outcomes. So our first goal is to just prevent further weight gain. Most people are on a trajectory of gaining and we want to stop that and then induce some weight reduction. And then we really want to both prevent complications and improve any that already exist and of course, improve quality of life. So we know that a five to 10% weight reduction can have some significant health benefits and that a greater reduction of course would have more benefits. So the goal is rarely to get somebody to a BMI below 30 or below 25, just like with diabetes when we, you know, the target is an A1C below seven. We know that when we're prescribing nutritional plans for our patients, that we are gonna get better results or better health outcomes when our interventions are evidence-based. So we don't wanna just get something off the internet and share that with our patients. We really wanna give them evidence-based interventions. We want those interventions will address both the quantity and quality of the food that our patients are eating. And then we have to choose interventions that they're going to be able to do and that they're on board with. So there's many nutrition plans available. These are some evidence-based ones. So we can do a carbohydrate restricted or fat restricted hypocaloric diet. These are very low calorie diets or usually a liquid diet that's 800 calories a day or less. But what most of us inter use for our patients are meal patterns. So examples of those are Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, keto diet, time-restricted eating has become more popular and intermittent fasting, and then my plate diabetes prevention program, which we'll talk more about today. 
So while these plans are all a little bit different, what they really have in common is that they all want to limit the unhealthful foods and then promote or encourage those that are more healthful. So ultra processed foods are just some of the worst things that any of us can eat. They're full of ingredients that don't provide much in the way of nutrition, and they contribute to a lot of chronic diseases. In that category are sweets and sweetened foods, as well as sweetened beverages, including juice, alcohol, sweetened alcohol drinks. Starches are something that we want our patients to limit. And then, of course, trans. What we really want to encourage is more whole foods. So protein, vegetables, fruit. If there's a choice between simple carbohydrates and complex, we want to shift on that spectrum to where we're getting more complex carbohydrates. And then water and non-sugared drinks. So in terms of physical activity, there's three main areas that we'll be talking about. The first is the aerobic activity or the cardio. The second is any kind of mus muscle strengthening activity, and then NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So let's dive into those. So the... Um, Physical activity guidelines for Americans recommend that we all get between 150 and 300 minutes per week of a moderate intensity activity. So that could be walking, slow bike riding, swimming at a slow pace, or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. So running, cycling, you know, things that are really intense, aerobics classes, that sort of thing. And people might get a combination of those, you know, maybe 75 minutes of moderate and, you know, 40 minutes of vigorous. And we want to have a combination. And then any benefit, there's lots of benefits if we go beyond that. For many of our patients, we're not coming anywhere near these targets and we'll talk about how to incorporate them into a plan, but this is what's considered to be the gold standard for health for all of us. We want those activities to be spread out over the week as much as possible, rather than the whole weekend warrior thing. That being said, if that's not an option for your patient, then we just want them to do whatever they can, whenever they can. And then we also know the benefit of muscle strengthening activities, and ideally someone would be getting about two sessions of that a week. That would be Pilates, uh, strength training, resistance bands, any of those activities. Even yoga can be a muscle strengthening activity. As people age, their muscle mass declines, and in particular for postmenopausal women. And so it's really important that we incorporate strength training into our patients' plans and really focus on that as people age. So NEED or non-exercise activity thermogenesis is just those things that we do all day long where we're active and taking the stairs instead of you know, the elevator where we park further away, and we're really trying to just get more steps into our daily activity. We know that just sitting is not good for us at all, or just laying, and that we want to do anything we can to get moving, and also to break up the times. For those of us, you know, that sit for a living, we don't have the option of being on our feet all day long, and so we want to, you know, have a strategy to get up every hour or so if we can, and then having people or suggesting to people that they come up with more active hobbies rather than more sedentary ones. So now that we know kind of the basics of the nutrition and physical activity guidelines, let's talk about how we can implement them into our primary care appointments. And this is probably one of the most challenging things in primary care, whether you're doing lifestyle for diabetes or obesity or other chronic conditions, it's really hard because you have such a limited amount of time. And I, you know, see patients just strictly for obesity, and we have a lot to talk about in our long appointments that I have with them. And so you have so much less in primary care. So we're going to talk about ways that you can just start small and bring these changes into your patient's plans. So we always want to do things in a stepwise manner. 
you know, we talked about the eating plans. We talked about the physical activity recommendations. It is ineffective to tell a patient what I just told you. You need to get between 150 and 300 minutes of moderate activity a week. That just, people just get so overwhelmed. They can't even, can't even get started. So we want to really do it in a stepwise manner. We want to individualize it to our patients, meet them where they are, make it be about them. And then we really want to match it to the disease burden. Some people have a lot of health challenges and it might be more difficult for them to incorporate, for example, physical activity. But we also want when someone has a severe state, is in a severe state, we really want to be aggressive at the same time. So there's the traditional way that most of us were educated to be providers is we're the experts, we tell the patient what to do, and they do it. And that just doesn't work with lifestyle treatments. It might work in the ICU or the emergency room, but it really doesn't work when we're helping our patients with chronic issues. And so we want to take on the role of a coach where we say that, you know, we're the coach, patients running the race. They know their lives, they're the experts, and really elicit what's important to them, and then start there with any initial goals, and then build on that with them being the expert on them and their lives. So something that's really important is if we can connect our patients' challenges with quality of life issues with what it is that we're suggesting that they do, in particular with eating and exercise. So really common issues for people with obesity are to have stamina issues. They get short of breath when they run their errands, go to the grocery store, a lot of joint pain. And so if we can help connect those issues that they're bringing to us and the things that are motivating them with the changes that we're suggesting, that can really go a long way. And then people really have some skin in the game. So again, we want to gradually incorporate changes into our patients' lives. We want to start substituting less healthy behaviors with more healthy behaviors. We want to help them set goals. We want them to be small and achievable. We really want to, them to feel successful and to build on that success. We want to use self-monitoring tools like fitness trackers, smartwatches, there's lots of phone apps, even notebooks. Some people really like paper and pen still. We want to utilize the brain's reward system by helping our patients come up with small non-food rewards that are frequent. I liken this to potty training, where we really lay it on heavy with people at first or our little kids at first, and then we don't usually need to as time goes on. And then super important to teach them not to keep tempting things in their environment. So many people think they should be able to resist them, but the brain just doesn't work that way. So if you're trying to assess your patient's current eating patterns, these are some questions that you can ask. You can do this with the patient. You can have your MA ask these questions. You can give them a questionnaire prior that they bring in with them, you know, and you can, you don't have to use all of them. You can use the ones that you think apply to that patient, but you really want to get some specifics about their current patterns before you start to zero in on what is the next step for them. So we'll talk about how to read nutrition labels. So the first thing on the top of the label is the serving size. And that is determined by the manufacturer, not by any agency that says this is the good amount of food. And what the manufacturers will often do is make it a very small serving size so that it looks like it's not too much of anything for the patient or, or for the person. The second area in the pink is the calories. And then in the yellow, we see the nutrients. So we list fat, cholesterol, sodium, total carbs, as well as the fiber and the sugars, and then protein. So one trick with the carbohydrates is that you can subtract the dietary fiber or the sugar alcohols to get the net carbs. 
because though, you know, the fiber and the sugar alcohols are not absorbed. And then you also want to look for the added sugars. And you can also determine that by looking at the actual ingredients. And then on the right in the purple is the daily values. We know that it's low if it's 5% or less and 20% or more is high. So the ideal is that people don't get more than 10 grams of total sugars in a serving. I actually think that's really high, but for patients that are having foods that have labels on them, we really are happy when they get below 10 grams. I like to see a 10 to one calorie to protein ratio, because that means that there's some, a good amount of protein in this food. And you really have to watch those grams of carbohydrates. And if they're not coming from the sugars, they're probably coming from some sort of refined starch. So my plate gives us a really easy way to look at a meal pattern. And the ideal is for a nine inch plate, we want to fill at least half the plate with vegetables and fruits, really want to emphasize the green veggies. While this says to limit fruit to half a cup, I think it's better to have fruit than starch or other refined carbohydrates. Fruit has a lot of fiber in it. So when you're thinking about your particular patient, you can modify this as needed. We really want to limit the starch to a quarter of the plate, but it isn't necessarily required to have it on there. So less is better. Rice, potatoes, pasta, those are all starches. Corn and peas are starches. So things like the beans that are pictured here are a good option to have on the plate. And then the other quarter is protein. We say about four ounces for women, six ounces for men. And there's a lot of meat substitutes out there. Many of them are starchy. So we want to stay away from those. So when we're talking about nutrition goals, we really want to focus on making one change at a time. We want to ask the patient, you know, what do you think would be a good next step for you? What would you like to focus on in the next whatever period of time it is till the next appointment? And you want to, as I said earlier, make it a small goal. So sometimes people will say that they're going to pack their lunch to work. And that's the change that they work on. Or they'll start tracking their meals. They'll plan their meals. A lot of people eat less frequent meals, but larger portions. So planning regular meals throughout the day is a really solid goal. Some will make a choice to limit their ultra processed foods to a certain number of servings a week, which is a big reduction from what they're having and then increase particular foods. So sometimes I'll recommend people, you know, add protein to every meal or snack that they have. So in terms of physical activity, we really want to assess what the patient is currently doing, what their readiness is, and if they have any mobility issues that might need further evaluation. I frequently refer patients to physical therapists for deconditioning and for assessment of any issues that they're having so that they're in a better place to be able to do physical activity. You always want to find out from your patients what's worked before for them, what was successful what kind of challenges that they had, their preferences for certain activities. People have different barriers for certain activities, or at least they perceive that they have barriers. Usually it's combination. And then something we have to think about is we don't want to send somebody out walking if they're not in a safe situation. So with all this, where do we focus with physical activity? What we really want to do is build a routine. So we want to get that established and usually with a pretty small goal, and then we can build on the consistency. So I think it's better for someone to walk for, you know, 10 minutes, three times a week, and then build on that pattern than to, to say, you know, do 30 minutes every day or 30 minutes once a week. We want to get it into their daily routine as much as possible and we start low and small and then build from there. You may have patients that are already really physically active and so you might just need to tweak this. And then we want whatever they're doing, might, they might not ever meet the guidelines, but we want what they're doing to be effective and sustainable. And the activity that your patient wants to do that they love or enjoy the most is probably the one that they're gonna do. 
So again, we focus on just making one change at a time, elicit our patient's goals. Examples as I gave is, you know, can you walk 15 minutes three times a week? Can you get on your exercise bike for five minutes, three days a week? I really try to help them find a way to make it enjoyable, either doing it with someone else, listening to music or audiobook or podcast. And then other, you know, they may not be able to do an actual exercise session, but other goals like parking further away, marching in place while they brush their teeth, building something into their daily routine, like getting off the bus one stop earlier or getting on one stop later, making it social. So doing things with friends, family, even kids. A great one is kids ride their bikes, parents walk. That, that can be really effective as well. So at my last obesity conference, we had John Jakasic come and speak to us. And he does all this amazing research about weight reduction and physical activity. And this is what he emphasized. We all need to sit less, stand off and move more. So anything we can do to bring that about for our patients will benefit them. So once we start with our initial activity or our initial appointment and we've got our initial plan, we always want to make sure that we schedule follow-up appointments. I know that's really hard to do in primary care and sometimes it might be three months or longer before somebody can come back, but I really recommend as frequently as you can see somebody. And you want to start by just asking them what's going well. And I, this is my practice, and I notice at a certain point, once patients have internalized that they'll come in and they'll just lead with that. They'll say, here's what went well. And then they'll tell me about the challenges that they've had. We always want to ask, you know, were there any challenges that you had? We want to reinforce any and all efforts that they make because people are really hard on themselves. And if they don't do the goal perfectly, they will think, you know, they failed. And so you really want to say, no, you didn't fail. You walked this many times or you went swimming or you, whatever it was that they did. You want to keep building the goals one on top of another. So once someone's established a certain routine, you want to ask, would you like to increase how often you do this, how long you do this, the intensity and let them make that decision and then always want to provide them any kind of education and resources that might be helpful for them. And then schedule the next follow-up before they leave so that you can check in with them again. So here's my clinical pearls. You really just want to meet people where they are. And it's far better to focus on the patterns and then get more precise as things progress. You want to take established habits and piggyback new ones onto them. So I was mentioning, you know, if somebody's doing some kind of some regular aerobic, you could ask, could you add five or 10 minutes of strength training onto that session? We really want to utilize the brain's reward system. So we want to make it a pleasurable experience as much as possible. Initially, consistency of a pattern is far more important than the degree of that change you can always build on it. And then as you coach your patients, as you're there for them, and are their strong supporter, they will learn to internalize that. And then you can help activate that inner coach for them and help them come up with things that they can say to themselves when things are challenging. So in summary, today we have learned that the best way to engage patients is to connect their lifestyle choices with any quality of life concerns or goals that they have. We wanna implement any nutrition or physical activity changes in a stepwise manner, and then provide education, resources, and support. All right, time for questions. Thank you, Sandra, for that great discussion. And I think this is what we have to figure out how to motivate and support and empower our patients. There was an interesting question in the chat. There's two parts to it. But the first one is, what about weight yo-yoing? How do we support sustained weight loss in our patients? Any tips or pearls on that? Or what do you do in your clinical practice as an obesity specialist? Well, that's a hard one. And that's why I was really emphasizing consistency. 
right? To, you know, people can get so excited in the beginning and they just want to do everything and make all these changes, but then they can be difficult to sustain. So you really want to start off in a, with a consistent pattern that you build on. The other factor is that the body metabolically adapts to weight reduction. So it will increase hunger hormones, decrease satiety hormones, even reduce the resting metabolic rate. And so it's a very physiologic thing that can contribute to that weight yo-yoing. So there's a lot of things at play, but really focusing on consistency can help the most. And that's a great point, I think. And I also tell my patients like, well, if we lose 30 pounds and we're able to maintain 20 pounds of weight loss, that's a great goal. I usually set that boundary at about 10 pounds. If we have more than 10 pounds of weight regain, what additional steps do we need to take? Do we need to add back a medication? Do we need to change something in the lifestyle? So I'd love to hear from Laura as well on that. Any tips on how to keep from weight regain? Well, I think initially when I see patients, I do set them up for the idea that their body is going to adapt during weight loss. And I really, like Sandra said, like, I think support is really critical. So when they do hit those periods, we're going to catch them hopefully sooner before they've regained, you know, most of their weight back. So I think the support, you know, coaching the patient to, so they know about this adaptation that's happening. And then, you know, when they do start to see it, then we can support them. Great point as well. So the other question that was as part of this question was about healthy at every weight. How do you discuss that with your patients and how do you address that in your weight management clinic? Yeah, that's a really great topic because what's behind the, you know, health at every size movement is to not shame people for carrying extra weight and to help them learn not to in or to counter that internalized weight bias right so when people have been discriminated against and stigmatized they internalize it and then they turn it on themselves so that's such a valuable movement for just self acceptance and what i will tell my patients is when you can love and accept yourself you're in the best place to make changes right because fear based changes might be successful initially, but not good for the long term. You can't sustain that. So, so accepting who you are doesn't mean that you don't want to improve this condition, this chronic disease of obesity. And so it's a hard, it's a hard one. At first, it, they seem like polar opposites, weight reduction and seeing it as a disease and then health at every size. But really, I think they can work really well together. Great points. And I agree. I sort of talk to my patients that we want to empower you at your current weight, but we're always going to talk about if it would be beneficial for your health, for weight loss, medications, lifestyle that might change that weight over time. But we are going to empower you at your current weight and then, you know, work with you together. And I think it is also reading the patient, right? You might take one different approach from one patient and, a, and another approach to, to another patient. And it really is just finding out and asking the patient, like, how are you going to, how best do you want us to talk about this issue? Because it is a hard one, definitely. Any other questions for Sandra? There was a question about central obesity. Any thoughts on patients who are negative for cushion where we know it's that's a rare one in a million diagnosis, but that visceral or central obesity, any additional imaging or evaluation you do from a hormonal standpoint? And then number two, anything you use to target that central obesity specifically? Yeah, so central obesity is a state of insulin resistance. And so anything that you can do to reduce the insulin resistance, so a reduced carbohydrate diet, activity that's divided into multiple sessions. So if someone can get at least 10 minutes of a moderate aerobic activity, they're going to get some insulin sensitizing benefits from that. And if they can do more sessions in a day, then they're going to get a synergistic effect. So from an insulin resistance perspective, three 10 minute sessions is better than one 30 minute session. So those are the kind of things I do to target that. 
Um, I always check a fasting insulin level. And so if that's elevated, I'm going to put them on metformin right away. Even the GLP ones, which aren't specifically targeting insulin resistance seem to reduce it as well. So for someone with central adiposity, we want to take that very seriously because they have elevated cardiometabolic risk and we want to be aggressive with nutrition, physical activity and pharmacotherapy for them. Thank you for those great points. And why don't we go ahead and start sharing our case? Do you want to, our, does our case presenter want to give us a little information about herself? Go ahead, take it away. My name is Banisha Shrestha. I am a family nurse practitioner. I work for CMAR Clinic up in Everett. I've been with the clinic for about five years and I've been seeing a lot of patients who have diabetes. Should I just jump right in with my presentation jump, for today? Jump in, case? we want to hear all about it. Yes. All right. <laughs> So I have a patient today. She is a patient of mine. I've known her for about a little close to a year. I've seen her six or seven times, I would say, in total this past year. She is a 49-year-old female Caucasian patient, comes to see me for diabetes. She has uncontrolled diabetes and few other issues. She does have insurance. She has Molina Apple Health, so state-funded. Her past medical history is pertinent to other than diabetes. She had a history of thyroid nodule, and I'll come back to that. Also has hyperlipidemia, hypertension, osteoporosis, sleep apnea, and does not use her CPAP machine. She also has history of major depression, general anxiety, a PTSD, chronic pain, and now is battling with homelessness. Oh yeah, also debilitating migraine. Um, Currently, this patient is on following medication here down on the medi current medication list. She is on Lantus, which is a fairly new medication. I started her on Lantus about two or three months ago. It hasn't been that long. And so she's titrated up to 45 units of bedtime. I also started her on Humalog recently, 10 units, three times a day for meal. She's on Genuvia, 100 milligrams, Pioglitazone, 30 milligrams. She's on 40 milligrams of atorvastatin, duloxetine for depression in for chronic pain, gabapentin for chronic pain slash migraine, imgality is prescribed by her neurologist for her migraine, and then she also takes losartan 25 milligrams. Her blood pressure is fairly well controlled. She has some chronic IBS type of diarrhea off and on, so she takes the mind for that. <clears throat> allergies or intolerance. She has allergies to penicillin and codeine and uh, cyclobenzaparine. She has intolerance to Jardians, metformin and lisinopril. With Jardians, she had a persistent bout of itis, yeast infection, and I have documented that at least three or four episodes treated and, and reoccurrent despite treatment. Metformin, she was actually taking this since her diagnosis of diabetes in 2014. She stopped about five or six months ago because she said that metformin is giving her brain fog, that she feels that she gets confused when she takes metformin. So she absolutely refuses to take metformin and I cannot convince her otherwise. She's actually stopped this medication for about four months now and reports to me that her brain fog has improved. Family history, hypertension with father, some heart disease, did not report any family history with her mom and a lot of diabetes and hypertension with her grandparents. Social history for this patient, she is divorced. She lives by herself. Well, she's homeless right now. She also has an adult son that's around her. They have a good relationship. Her mom is also around. She's actually in between living with her mom and in her car right now. Prior to that, she was living independently in an apartment and she ended up losing this apartment about six months ago because she was not able to keep up with the, her education level. She has some college. Previously, she was working as a CNA and then stopped working because she injured her back. Since then, she's been kind of back and forth between working at a gas station to being an Amazon, Amazon delivery di driver. For the past two years that I've known of, she has been unemployed and she's actually been trying to get her degree in uh, as a mental health counselor. That has kind of come to a pause right now because of losing housing and all of that. Like I said, she's divorced. She does not smoke, she does not drink alcohol, no use of any other marijuana drugs. Her vitals, she's five feet five, 20, 200 pounds. Her BMI is 33. Her blood pressure has always been well controlled, 102 over 70 last time I checked and her heart rate was 82. These are her lab values. Her random glucose when I saw her last time was 387, A1C greater than 14. And I think this is a recheck after three months. 
So this has been going on for at least five months. Her creatinine is 0.53, cholesterol 266, LDL 154, HDL 45, triglycerides, random 333. Her albumin is 30 and her liver functions are normal. I did check her vitamin B12 and it was actually greater than 2000 and she was on multiple supplements that had vitamin B12 in it. Folate was normal, 24. Her thyroid was 0.79 and vitamin D was slightly low, 19. We were actually, with the help of my nutritionist in the clinic, we were able to connect her with a Libre, a continuous glucose, and this is her reading for the 14 days. So she's at a very high level, 100% of the time. So she just wakes up with high glucose. And this kind of correlates with the A1C we've been getting in the clinic. This is the trend for her A1C, which I thought was interesting if you look at it. She wasn't doing all that bad two years ago. I saw her around when she was 8.3. I think around that time I added Genuvia and then she dropped to 7.4. And then after that, she stopped taking. And I, th I think at some point I also added Jardians at that point. And then she stopped taking Jardians. She stopped taking Metformin and she slowly climbed back up to 8.3 and then she lost her housing and then she is 14 now. Uh, her foot exam has been up to date. It's normal. She does not have retinopathy. She does score high in PHQ-9 and GAD despite treatment with Cymbalta. And she also has her mental health counselor she, that she's been seeing for a while. She's up to date with her dental visit. So these are some of her barriers, so to speak. So just to sum it up, she was well controlled or she was fairly well controlled at some point. And then suddenly uh, five months ago, um, took turn for worse after we stopped metformin and Jardians. And then she was in Genuvia. So I added pioglitazone. And then I added Lantus, and now I've added Humalog. But her glucose has not changed much since I've last seen her. And so the barriers being homelessness. And then the other big factor with that is that she seems to be emotionally eating a lot. So previously, she was doing a good job of, you know, getting up and going for a walk routinely, counting her carbs and just being very cognizant and mindful about what she's eating for the day. Now she, she endorses just, you know, eating a lot of processed food, chips, packets, dinners, a lot of emotional eating, does not like vegetables. Some days she doesn't eat at all. And some days there's a lot of snacking. This is her typical meal. She usually does a bowl of cereal with 2% milk, a diet soda for in between meals. Sometimes she'll drink regular soda, lots of hot pockets. PB&J is her go-to meal. Frozen mac and cheese. She would also Panda Express frequently and then sometimes just, you know, drive through. Well, lots of bags of chips from what I recall. Yep. So my question is, I want to put her on GLP-1, but she has a reported history of thyroid nodule and this was, and she had it removed. This was back in 1980s or early 1990s in a different state. I have no access to any of her records and she does not actually re remember what clinic she went to, exactly what happened. If it was just a nodule, was benign, she, we're not sure. She thinks she was, she recalls that, she vaguely recalls that she was told it was cancerous, but she actually still has her thyroid gland and her thyroid level is fairly okay. She's not getting any thyroid replaced. So I want to put her in GLP-1. I think she would benefit from metformin, but um, I've tried my best and I cannot convince her to go back on it. She would, she refuses. I think insulin will help out, but when it comes to insulin and having her take it four times a day and with her being, you know, in and out of her mom's home and living in her car, I, you know, I question the feasibility of it long-term treatment wise. And that's all I have. So that's a great presentation and you're obviously dealing with a lot. And I think the most important thing to highlight is you do seem to have such a good relationship already with this patient, which is the first step. Does anyone have any clarifying questions for this patient before we move on to the case discussion? I have some. Go ahead. So how, for how long has she had type two diabetes? She was diagnosed in 2014. 2014. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I'm trying to get a timeline as to what's occurred for her. So did she have, I know that you said that she was on LNI in the 
report. So has she, is her claim still open? Do you know what the, the return to work possibilities are for her? Her LNI claim has been going on since 2018, as far as I can tell. I have not talked to her directly about what's going on with her case. But I think at this point, return to work is not her goal. The claim was filed when she was working as a CNA and she hurt her back. And then through LNI claim, actually, she was getting some subsidies to pay for her housing. And I think the claim closed and that's how she ended up losing her income that she was using to you know, have an apartment. And so her plan was to finish the school, be a mental health provider, and then, you know, have a job that way. But that's kind of on a halt, too. Okay. So do do you have a sense of what she does then on a daily basis? She is unemployed right now. She's not working. uh, Yeah. Yeah. In the past, she's, you know, worked at a gas station. She's done some Amazon delivery. But at this time, she's unemployment, unemployed. This past few months, there's been a lot of, you know, f- uh, some falls and, you know, few incidences with, you know, severe headaches and dizziness and whatnot. So it's been one thing after the other nonstop, resulting in, you know, her not being able to keep a job too. So. Okay. And do you know what the, you know, she's been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Do you know what, what the traumatic event or events had been? Good. I have no idea. Good question. No, but we've never gotten to that point where I would, you know, <laughs> yeah, have the time or to sit down with her and really dig in. She does have a mental health provider and our system does not connect. So I actually don't get any feedback from them. So I have limited knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. So with the thyroid issue, you know, she had, does she have a scar? Do does, does you think she had surgery? Because some- She did. She yeah, did. she does have a scar. And so multiple nodules were removed based on what she told me. And I asked her, were you told this is a cancer? Were you put on radiation, anything? And she said, no radiation or any other treatment other than the removal of the nodules. And that she was told it could have turned into a cancer if it was not removed. All right. So, yeah, then this is a very interesting case. Thank you so much for sharing this, you know, case with us. There are a lot of things to discuss. So, you know, you did a great job of presenting. So, I'll go really quick so we have time to to talk about the many topics. So, she is a 49 year old with type two diabetes and obesity, and she has many comorbidities, you know, including that history of thyroid nodules at a young age, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis without a fracture. That's another question I had. How was I imagine this osteoporosis is second by DEXA scan? Or how was this osteoporosis diagnosed based on what information? It is just listed as a diagnosis. I actually have not looked into if, you know, it was like a DEXA scan or she's actually not even getting any treatment for it, actually. Okay. Yeah. Because again, you know, like she's young and then her mom yeah. has a history of, she just fractured her hip. So, okay. So she also has a history of sleep apnea, doesn't use CPAP machine, PTSD, major depression, general anxiety disorder, homeless, chronic pain, migraines. So she does have, you know, so many life stressors and socioeconomic challenges. These are the medications that she's on, the you know, weight, BMI, which is pretty good, and the several intolerances and allergies to medications. And you had these specific questions for us, and I thought those questions were great. Right, so I'm kind of going to jump. I won't you know, have that order to answer the questions, but I'm hoping that we will be able to answer all of these questions. They're really great. You know, we always ask what type of diabetes are we seeing here? So you can like ask that there. Uh, should I plan on checking C peptide in GADS after average glucose gets lower than 200? So I think we all agree that this patient is insulin resistant. Insulin resistant. And you're right. Like I don't think it's a good idea to check C peptide right now because of the glucotoxicity. It could be low and we might be just misled. I probably, you know, I with the history, having diabetes for so long, I don't think I would need to check for thyroid GAD antibodies later unless I hear, unless, you know, there are a lot of autoimmune diseases in the family. She doesn't seem to have an autoimmune disease. We don't know the cause of the thyroid nodules. We don't know if it's Hashimoto's, but she's not on thyroid medication. 
right now. So that's addressing the first question. And then we also, you know, like always ask like, what is the hemoglobin A1C goal for this patient? And well, right now, just, you know, for teens. So I would be happy if we are able to decrease A1C by 2% in you know, like every three months. I wouldn't really, you know, that would be already a significant improvement and progress because of all the barriers and all the challenges that she's having. Yeah. So then let's now move on to normal non-pharmacologic interventions. So, you know, right here, you know, this is when her life really became even more complicated with, you know, being homeless and now taking care of her mom who, you know, struggling with a fracture and also, abuse at home. So she, not surprisingly, you know, the, that had a significant impact on her glucose control. So then you ask, like, how do I convince this patient that there is no correlation between her brain fog with use of metformin? This is my personal approach. Like, I usually don't try to convince patients because once they already, they are sure, you know, like they state that that's the, the cause. And furthermore, she says that the brain fog has improved. So then I feel that me questioning that, you know, I it might affect the trust because she would then wonder why I don't believe her. But I'm very curious to know, if Dr. Ward, if, did you have any recommendations? Have you, you know, about us trying to talk to the patient about, I think you should be on metformin? Well, I think that what's Obviously, an important part of diabetes care is to always, you know, think about using language that's more like patient first and strength based, and that you know that the patient, you know, should is she gets to choose what she wants in terms of her care, and so that's actually that's actually really important for the patient in terms of your collaboration with her and being able to you know explore more as to you know, even like, what was it like that brain fog and how did it even affect her so that you might even have a better understanding as to why she actually is resistant to psychologically resistant to wanting to use that medication again. And because it's really important that she feels supported around her decision. Thank you. Okay, then you know, talking about non-pharmacological interventions, one of the questions was, what are some of the tasty, low-carb, affordable, and easy-to-prepare options for patients so she stays motivated to change her nutritional choices? So this is really a fantastic question. And we have Allison, or you know, nutritionist, who has a lot of experience and has written the guidelines from the American Diabetes Association. I'm going to ask her to give us many tips. So I, regarding Sandra's comments about the plate method, I'm just going to kind of build on that. So if, if you could advance two more pushes, especially like if the patient is eating food, bringing perhaps that portion back to the house and actually using the plate method concept to kind of see how much starchy food, how much protein, you know, once you've identified kind of the compartments, you know, hopefully that, you know, the portion should go in, she can see how much she's eating. If people are picking up food at fast food restaurants and such, sometimes there's this mindless associate effect of they're not really knowing how much volume of food they're eating. So to help them quantify that. Next slide, please. And then next slide. The next one. And next one. If you can... Um, Sorry, I have all these animations in here. I should have taken them out. But I mean, eating healthfully does not have to cost a lot of money or be difficult to prepare. Like a sandwich that can be made with inexpensive whole grain bread and some protein, peanut butter, cheese, or meat can be a nice combination. Sandra had mentioned about including protein at the meal. And I always say, Protein helps add satiety to the meal. So often our patients on a budget are eating top ramen and things like that that are craft macaroni and cheese dinners, and it's very carb-based. And so they're not feeling very satisfied with that meal. But having a George Foreman grill and a microwave, not even having a stove, you can make with vegetables, a sweet potato and a burger. Next slide, please. And 
this just shows like if they were eating like a box dinner or, uh, you know, that comes with the meat or you just add a hamburger to it, helping reinforcing that combination that half a plate could be starch and protein. But then on the other side of the plate is that non-starchy vegetable. Next slide, please. And this just shows you that this can be used with a variety, this plate concept of different ethnicities as well. Next slide, please. And so just to kind of power through this one, I never tell a patient they can't eat something. I always say, let's see what happens to you when you eat those foods using that cause and effect relationship. Check your glucose before you eat the whole portion from Panda Express and then check two hours later and then perhaps another time use the plate method where you're portioning out just a quarter of the plate of starch using that same strategy of that cause and effect relationship and helping pa the patient learn and that perhaps they can eat, you know, a lot of the foods that they enjoy, but maybe just changing up the, the components or the quantity. Next slide, please. This is just to remind you, if you're going to ask about pre and post checking to make sure you give them glucose targets. Next slide, please. And then just using that plate method very quickly, you could say, what would you eat for dinner tonight? You know, a patient is going to be able to empowering them to learn these tools. If you just tell them what to eat, it's not going to be as effective as if you kind of help them work through a 24 hour period, and then they can build on that when they get home. Next slide. Next slide. And then I think just checking back in, taking a picture of their meal, sometimes that can help show you what the portions are when you're in the appointment. Next slide. These are some meal planning strategies. I always tell patients eating healthy does takes time and it takes an investment, you know, knowing what their budget is, how many people are there, are they feeding? If you want to eat healthily, like so many of us probably even listening today, don't know what we're going to have for dinner tonight. <laughs> and so if you have limited funds coming up with three menus, perhaps a week, next slide, please. Meal planning can be a drag. So if she is living with her mother and taking care of her, she can come up with one or two meals and her mom can can come up with one or two meals, having some ground rules that, that when you come up with a meal, it needs to have a non-starchy vegetable with it. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And these are just some quick things where if you start with chicken and you make a little bit more, how you can have two more meals out of it. Next slide. Turkey's on sale now. You can buy a turkey breast and re you know, make different a couple of different meals out of things. Next slide, please. So these are all inexpensive cuts of meat and just showing you how you can repurpose them for different sorts of meals. Next slide, please. Also talking about plant-based meals and beans, even sometimes people think they're high in starch, but they have a ton of fiber in them and they're very filling and a great source of protein. Next slide. And then the, these will be my three last slides. These are some recipe website, diabetesfoodhub.org. Next slide. Eating well, I guess next slide. Eatingwell.com. And then last slide, all recipes. They all have budget option that you can use. Often our patients' food choices result in them gaining weight over time. So sometimes we have to break the cycle of the things that they're always eating by, you know, encouraging them like one time next week, pick a recipe. You know, you can pick a recipe and your mom can pick a recipe, kind of rebuilding their kind of eating food library. And now I'm done. Great points there, Allison. I think that's great. Specifically in, I'm going to ask you one other question. For this particular person, when you saw her, what would be your first thing you would ask her what small change she would make or how she would make it? Like, is there one goal you'd have for her initially? Because she is caring for her mom who is disabled right now and she is stress eating. So what would you choose as the number one thing to address first? Well, with I her? think 
I guess if I only had one thing, I would say, put your food that you're eating on a plate to have a visual so you can see how, you know, how much you're eating instead of just eating out of a box or a bag. If I had one other thing, you know, I would just say, try to come up with a meal plan for the next two days. Yeah. You know, I think have a plan. That's the most important thing. And I did go on to Panda Express and I saw that you can get like a 350 calorie brown rice and one entree bowl, but you can also get three entrees and a side. So I was like, oh, for budgeting, she could have three meals out of that and that she could select those ones that were the 350 calories and even get a little less rice, right? Because then it would be divided between three meals. So I think you know, I always tell people I'm making suggestions that may work for you and help with your budget, but I'd, otherwise I'm just talking at you. What do you want to do is the last thing, right? So go ahead, Lorraine. Great points that Allison made and just great ideas from those websites. Yeah. So then the other question was, what are some options for physical activity for patients who have chronic pain with no access to gym? And I'm actually going to ask Nicole to talk about this so this website, which is from the Nas National Institute of Aging, was actually suggested to me by an old colleague and former CDE of mine from George Washington University. And what I really like about this website is it focuses on the four components for your health and physical ability. So endurance, strength, balance, and flexibility. And what it does for each of those big categories is it tells you like, some safety tips for starting those things, and then ideas of the activities that fall in those things. And then it actually has embedded videos that sort of show some of the activities. So they have the right position and the right activity. And so this site I found very helpful when people are sort of struggling to figure out what to do. And I might tell them, pick a few days out of the week and you know, and each day you choose a different endurance, strength, balance, and flexibility. When someone who's living with chronic pain, I think accessing all these components because her ability and endurance may be very low, but if she improves her flexibility and strength, she actually might feel better. So I'd be curious from Sandra, any other websites you use or what are you, what do you tell people for physical activity? Yeah, I didn't know about this one. This is excellent. I'm just doing some work right now on how to help women over 60 be more active. You know, what comes to mind for her is the insulin resistance and getting her, it sounds like she had, I don't know what type of chronic pain, myofascial, but to just get her to move a little bit, you know, if she could choose some sort of activity where she could move for 10 minutes, you know, that would help her depression. It would help her diabetes. And again, start with what would she like to do that fits in the parameters of what she has available. And I think that's a great point. The first thing is for her to pick something small and then to build on it. And I think that's a common theme that we're always talking about. Yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't matter where you start. You just got to start the, down the road. Go ahead, Lorena, keep going. Some great points can come out here. Yeah. And then the other question, and this is a great question, a very interesting question and kind of timely. So can I take a risk and add LP1 despite po possible history of thyroid cancer? And if you, that would have been my answer, you know, seven days ago, <laughs> like, no, yes, you know, go for it. I still would do it, but I'm going to explain why, you know, that now I'm going to be a little more cautious talking about GLP-1s and a history of thyroid cancer. So I would first, you know, like get a little more information about the thyroid history. So she does have a history of thyroid nodules, but we don't know whether she had Hashimoto's. She, she very likely had a hemithyroidectomy because she's not on thyroid medication and her DSH is normal. So she does have a scar, right? So she did have surgery. I didn't, you know, it seemed like by physical exam, probably the thyroid was not anything concerning, but if she does, you know, it's. We are limited because we don't know the information, right? Like, and she doesn't remember the clinic, but, but it might be helpful, you know, to do a thyroid ultrasound just to see if there, you know, a fibrosis, any Hashimoto's just to assess 
risk. This, you know, history of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancers was like in the 80s. So this is like a long time ago and that's reassuring, but I would just get a little more information about it. So this is a study, uh, this is a meta-analysis of many randomized control trials, you know, that use GLP-1 receptor agonists. And they basically, what they observe in this analysis is that uh, there was really no an association of GLP-1 receptor agonists and thyroid cancer, as you can see here, right? Like the relative risk and also, you know, no association with hypothyroidism, thyroiditis, mass or goiter. And we do, you know, as you know, the GLP-1 receptor agonists have a warning that these medications are contraindicated in patients with medullary thyroid cancer. That is a very different type of thyroid cancer. It's not the most common, you know, popular thyroid cancer. And that mainly comes from data from rodents. So I always been, you know, this thyroid cancer has never been really a concern of mine when I, I use it in patients who have a history of thyroid cancer and as long as it's not my thyroid cancer. However, you know, again, you know, like that's a week ago, but this was published, this study was published November 10, so just very recently online first, this care. And this is a study in France. It is a retrospective study. They look at, you know, data from their healthcare system and the patients who are with diabetes and who were users of GLP-1 receptor agonists, and they match the subjects with controls. Really with 20 patients per 20 controls. And they match type length of diabetes and other socioeconomic factors. Uh, and what they observe is that patients who had been on a GLP-1 receptor agonist for more than one year, they had a higher there was an association with thyroid cancer, all different types of thyroid cancer, not medullary thyroid cancer necessarily, that is very rare. They also saw an association with DDPP4 inhibitors when these were used for more than three years. And that is interesting because, you know, like the DDPP4 inhibitors, basically, the, well, they just inhibit the enzyme that breaks up the GLP-1. So this hormone, so this will be the native, you know, like our own GLP-1 hormone in the case of the DPP-4 inhibitors. So I, well, you know, it's good to know about this. So what to do, right? I would, in this case, right, like I would, this study, by the way, I mean, this study wouldn't really, wouldn't stop me from doing GLP-1s, but this is definitely something that I would discuss with the patients because very likely we are going to hear about this more than this was just recently published. Having said that, though, you have to you know, uh, this is a retrospective study uh, compared to many, you know, like a meta-analysis, many randomized control trials. So also one thing that I, that they didn't adjust in this study was for weight. You know, and as you know, patients who are overweight or obese, they do have a higher, you know, risk of cancer. So I thought that was like a big limitation of the study. So Having said that, right, like, so then this is how I would talk to this patient or a patient with a concern for thyroid cancer. I would say that thyroid nodules are very common You know, more than 70% of people who had a, an autopsy, they had nodules. More than half people, you know, older than 60 might have thyroid nodules. And medullary thyroid cancer, you know, that's a contraindication is very rare. And that data comes mainly from rodents. We don't really have a case report even, you know, or not, or in primate, primates, that there is a case report of a use of GLP-1 receptor agonists in medullary thyroid cancer. This is all from rodents. Most studies, as I show you, have shown no associated risk. So in this case, right, like we now have learned a lot about this group of medications and all the benefits that these medications have on weight, on glucose control. As we know, all medications have benefits, potential risks. So the, in this case, you know, the benefit, the cardiovascular benefit, the uh, kidney benefits, the effect on weight, the effect on glycemic uh, control, and all the you know, complications that are secondary to diabetes and being overweight or obese, I feel that, you know, the benefits of these medications definitely are bigger than the potential risk of increased thyroid cancer. So I would discuss this with the patient, right? Like, and then I would have appropriate surveillance, you know, uh, of a patient with a history of thyroid cancer with thyroid ultrasounds and, uh, you know, exams and so on. 
Do you have, what do you think, Nicole? What would you do or tell the patient? So the first thing I would tell the patient is the good news is that your disease was from the 80s and we may never know if it was thyroid cancer or not, but usually in the 80s, if you had any cancer, you'd get a total thyroidectomy. So that's my first clue that she didn't have thyroid cancer. It was maybe precancerous or indeterminate and that's why she had the hemithyroidectomy. As well, the next thing I would tell her is that She's now greater than 10 years from her primary disease. So the risk of it recurring is very low, even if she had thyroid cancer. And that, you know, right now her risk is to her overall health. And so I would say to mitigate her biggest risk to go ahead with the GLP-1. But I agree that if she was, I would not do an ultrasound on this person. You're likely to find an incidental nodule will just worry her. But if she wants, if she needs more reassurance, that would be the reason why I would do an ultrasound to support her. And then if we found something, we would just follow it. But I, even if she had a nodule in her thyroid, I'd still recommend the GLP-1. And then the final thing I would tell her is, you know, you're not going to develop cancer with a month of use. So why don't you see three months of use and the effect of it for your diabetes management and how you feel? And then we can make a decision about long-term use and the risk benefit of it. So I would try to go over all those things. And I know in your 15 minute clinical visit, you probably won't have time, but that's how I would address it with her and to support her. Thank you, Nicole. Great. Okay. So then now for her glucose control, right? For her insulin management, it was very appropriate that she was started on insulin, right? With that A1C of 14. So we have had, you know, like many examples on how to calculate insulin. Usually, you know, for basal insulin, we don't recommend to go more than 0.5 units per kilogram. She's 91 kilograms her max dose would be 45.5. So then you know, do you, that's the dose that she's at 45 right now. And you mentioned that has been increased, right? We, we didn't start at that dose. So then I wouldn't go higher than that. But if I was just going to start, well, I, I wouldn't start her at 45, I would start less than that. And then we calculate by weight, well, like then Randall insulin, 15 units. She was started on 10 units. I think that was very appropriate. I agree. I would have started also with 10. And this is just so you have as a reminder, once you have this live deck, you know, how to calculate the doses for type 1 versus type 2. In her case, I do worry about her really using the insulin because, you know, even patients who use the insulin sporadically, you can, you know, you see some ups and downs. And her, she was just like, you know, off the roof, like off the chart, really, you couldn't even see the blood sugars there in the CGM sometimes. We all agree, you know, she is going through such difficult times that anything that to simplify her regimen, because she has so much on her plate and with her mom and so on. So then I would consider switching to mixed insulin just so you know, because I worry about her not adherence. So if I was going to do that, I would start her up probably like 30 units, that's 30 units of mixed insulin, that's like 21 units of NPH, right? So then kind of thinking about the basal twice a day, I would also stop Januvia because I would prefer a GLP-1, right? Like the GLP-1 receptor agonists are, have a significant effect on weight and they are really more potent. Januvia, you know, like it decreases A1, well, in her case, it seemed like it decreased A1C by 1%, but that's usually not very strong. I would also stop uh, pioglitazone because she does have a history of osteoporosis and pioglitazone might have a negative effect on bone density. So then, you know, which is kind of sedentary, she already has osteoporosis. So then I wouldn't, I would, again, prefer a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, an SGLT2 inhibitor wouldn't help her very much right now because she's, you know, if you remember the mechanism of action of these medications is like causing glycosuria and she's already very glycosuric right now because her blood sugars are just very high. So then an SGLT2 inhibitor is not really going to add much. I would also ask her, she, she's reluctant, you know, like to start an SGLT2 inhibitor, but I would ask her whether she's still having yeast infections right now that she's not on an SGLT2 inhibitor, just because, you know, Maybe I can have a discussion. It is all that sugar in the urine, you know, like, so then if she's still having the yeast infections right now, I would say, you know, that's all the sugar because of your blood sugars are not very well controlled. We'll work on that. 
And I wouldn't bring up an SGLT2 inhibitor right now, but maybe just a little prep for perhaps in the future. And again, you know, like I would have like with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, it will be a shared decision after, you know, talking about what we know about GLP-1s and thyroid cancer and, and then a thyroid ultrasound, if there is just concern, if you feel a nodule, you know, like I probably would order it, you know, but, but that's just something that you would discuss with her, all the benefits of, of the GLP-1s. And some great that. points there, Lorena. And, you know, because we had such a complex case, I will just say we only touched on the surface of all the things that we could address with her, just like you're typically doing in your primary care clinic. But hopefully you had a few little ideas of where to start. The final thing is with that A1C of over 14, I would just make sure she's actually seeing any of the insulin since she's newer to insulin. Make sure that the cap is off of the needle tip. I've seen that. Make sure she is inserting the needle and then pushing it so and seeing it go to zero. So I think all of us who've worked with patients living with insulin, we've seen people who we kept going up on the insulin. And then when they demonstrated their technique, we did see that they were actually delivering no insulin. So that would be my final little pearl. And then just you know, also discussing with her in a non-judgmental way, it, you know, barriers to for her taking the insulin, because I agree with Lorena, we should see at least some decline because the dose you have her on is, you know, above 0.7 units per kilogram of insulin daily. So I wouldn't expect her to be an A1C of greater than 14. So I wish we had more time for questions, but because of the time, we're going to say this ends session 16 of the Cardiometabolic Echo. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.